So this is um, an example of the seven layers of the forest garden in our garden. But you've got trees, you've got shrubs, herbs, ground covers, roots and climbers. And they're all edible, medicinal or um, useful in some ways. We also, <laughs> apart from food and medicines, we also grow um, plants for pollinators to up the productivity, nitrogen fixers, uh, plants for structure. So I'll, sh I'll come to that in a minute. So this is a picture that Mr. Burnett will recognise. I'll give you a little bit of a credit there because Graham drew it and I take that with, I hope, goodwill and his licence. <laughs> So just explaining how, how you're, you're filling all of the niches from, from the climax canopy all the way down. And of course, you know, in a tropical forest, you can cram it all in together so that you're totally, you know, you've got everything almost stacked on the vertical underneath each other. And, and that's kind of when you start, you think, oh, that's going to be the ideal. I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have every niche full. There'll be no room for any, you know, weed species I don't want. But it doesn't work like that. Instead, <coughs> we had to forget all about Kerala and Belize and all these scrummy, warm, subtropical, or even Australia, you know. We had to forget about all that marvellous, what Stefan Geyer would call permaculture porn. <laughs> there, are, there is some porn in my garden, and that's what I want to share with you. It's like, how can we have permaculture porn in the cool, temperate climate? We can, but only a little bit. So, so this is Martin Crawford. Martin Crawford is from the Agroforestry Research Trust in Devon. He is absolute world authority on all the seven, you know, species of plants for all those seven niches um, from the top canopy right down to the root systems. He's researched inexhaustively for over 25 years. He's really remarkable. Um, and then he has plant nursery. So he's been really influential for us. Um, so, and, and I was very happy to see that, you know, we'd been see him every five years or something. And as our garden grew and developed over time, I was really happy to see that we'd had ideas that we thought that we, were our ideas. Um, and we went and saw that he'd done the same thing. Because of course there are patterns in nature and, and it's our job to interpret those patterns and then plant in those kind of guilds or, or, or ways that replicate natural patterns. So, you know, we're all doing it. So, this is ground zero. So we didn't, when we bought a house, we didn't have um, a big, garden we had a bit of a paved yard which is how we bought it um, because um, it was cheaper <coughs> and uh, so Tim had this dream that we would acquire up to here and that we'd write and badger the landowner until eventually they surrendered and and let him buy a part of the field as a garden extension and we managed that in 1994 and I just want you to know that this, underneath this sort of rustic idyll, was a totally ploughed out field. That hedge line was that higher because it had lost that much topsoil. We're on flint and chalk, so it was all subsoil and, and then hard chalk. You dig down in some places that far, six inches that or more and you'd get a white, bony, in almost, you know, sometimes you'd have to use a pickaxe to plant a tree. And the, it had, you know, it was 
arable crops every year never rested and then intensive use of um, chemical fertilizer to keep the system going and this is what it looks oh, imagine imagine green lush that's exactly the same place in about 2008 2009 so that's 14 years um, and, he, and every year the biodiversity increases and increases and so do the yields. <coughs> third of an acre, 0.26 hectares, I believe, for Europeans. Um, so how did we do it? We used um, to scale on a grid paper with an overlay, which we learnt from Max Lindiger, how to design on paper. It's very resilient for when we have power down. No computers. And we thought, right, we're going to select all the trees that we want to plant. And we're going to calculate their canopy relative to the scale of the, the template uh, at, at the point of their greatest maturity. And then we're going to... Um, to plot them out with blue tack. It's very sophisticated. <laughs> and actually it was a really useful way of doing it. So, so you'll see that there's a kind of great big bit in the middle that hasn't got trees in it, which is very different to how Graham's garden is. And this is for a, a reason that I will elaborate on. So we, so we had this soil that was like, you know, a wound. And the first thing we did was we covered that wound with a dressing, with a bandage. And it's real ecosystem repair, this. We took the most native wildflower species mix that we could find relatively local to us and we just sowed it. We sowed an annual mix mixed with perennials. And the other thing we did was around all the outside, we planted Hampshire, so local to our county our region hampshire native species mix because there was just no, once that npk that fertilizer had leached out of the soil there was nothing there to feed the trees so we couldn't plant anything that would have a need for very much food and then we started planting and of course you know we wanted to fit everything in so we had a big planting day we got a barrel of beer, we invited all our friends, said, hey, you know, we've got 80 fruit and nut trees, please come and plant them with us. Um, but before Tim had gone out and he'd got his grid and he'd put bamboos in where every single tree was going. So he, he was very methodical and he, he had a plan and each tree was plotted out according to the canopy at mature stage and it was all on a grid of baler twine any of you Brits here the the beautiful free resource in our community baler twine that ties up straw and he spent two weeks um, wandering around fiddling with bamboo and I was thinking what what's he doing and actually he what he was doing was um, imagining walking underneath the canopy when it was mature and realising that he'd be walking around the garden like this because this is the most fundamental mistake that people make in forest gardens. They think, oh yes, I want apricots, I want walnut, I want apple, I want shrubs. Cram them in. Cram them in. And of course, if you do that, you spend an awful lot of time pruning. You have no proper, um, you don't get the canopy in the sun of each tree, you, you get diseases, you get too many branches that rub and can cause problems for the tree. You know, generally, it's a recipe for an unhealthy garden. And, and you have to, in a cool temperate climate, you have to give the space. You, you can't replicate the jungle in quite the same way. OK, so stacking in space and time. So here you've got exactly as you suggested. We've got pears and medlar, Turkish medlar, a walnut tree, and they're all mixed up underneath with comfrey and jostaberry 
um, and the mixed hedge, which is native species mixed with edibles as well. So there's some quite robust um, trees like um, wild plum, Prudus myroballum, um, elderberry, and um, we've, we've had success with growing damson in hedgerows and allowing it to go to standard and wild service tree as well. Um, and then underneath, one of the best things we've found is gooseberries because they can't, they still fruit in low light. So in the earlier times, while these little sticks are, you know, growing, um, we've mulched the ground and then we've infilled with as many different currants as possible. So we like these successional cropping species. And we're trying to achieve that with things like apple. So we have about 20 varieties of apple and they start cropping around July and go late into the year. And some of them are not as sweet and tasty, but they store really well. So one apple tree we have is called Hambledon Dezin. And Hambledon, excuse my French, Hambledon is our, the village next to us and Dezin is two years and the reason why this apple tree was popular until refrigeration became fashionable is it's stored not just for one winter but for two in the right conditions so if you had a failure um, with your crops the next year for any reason like a late hard frost that killed the the fruit um, you would have at least something in the store and I would recommend to all of you, um, plant one apple tree at least that is local to your village or your, your area in wherever you live in cool temperate climes. Because, you know, it's so important that, you know, that apple tree was local to you traditionally for very good reason.